everyone. We are now live and almost on time. Congratulations to us. I'm joined today by Bill Keel, uh, who is running us from Alabama, Kara Masters, who is from Portsmouth, and Kevin Javinsky in Zurich. And let's see, so we've got lots of questions to talk about today, lots of things to cover because several things have happened since the last Hangout. The first thing is that we, we made some changes, actually, not to the Galaxy Zoo site itself, but to the galaxies that we show. Um, we used to have, well, when we put in the galaxies from, for Galaxy Zoo 4, there's a sample of galaxies that are a little bit more local from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. There's a lot of their, those. There's hundreds of thousands of those. And then there's about 50,000 galaxies that are from CANDLES, which is a survey uh, of the Hubble with the Hubble telescope of, of a smaller portion of the sky, but it goes much, much deeper, so you see further, more distant galaxies, um, and the resolution is much, much better. Um, so even though they're smaller, you still see them at sort of approximately the same sizes. Anyway, when we were looking at candles and trying to decide what galaxies to put in, we kind of were conservative in the sense that uh, humans are really good. You guys are really good at finding faint features and finding things signal within this noise. So there are these kind of faint galaxies that uh, we thought, well, you know, there's, we can tell even details of faint galaxies that the computers can't. Um, but with your tags and with your help, now that we've gotten some way into the classifications, we've realized that some of those uh, are basically done, that just the classifications we already have which is maybe a quarter of the way to where we need to be uh, for the really bright ones, where we know all the details. For the really faint ones, just what we have is enough. So we did some analysis and used your tags to figure out what galaxies those were, because that's sort of hard to determine from, from just a computer analysis as well. Um, and so we reduced the number of galaxies that you see in, in the Hubble sample um, that you're going to continue to see, but we've actually been showing them a little bit more often so the idea is that you get to see some, some brighter samples and some more interesting, more featured things. Um, there are still some faint fuzzy blobs, but there might be some more galaxies like this. So <clears throat> I thought it might be interesting for the science team to give their input on, on, on these types of galaxies because a lot of the, the questions that we get on talk, uh, and so I presume a lot of the questions that people don't even ask on talk, are just things like, how do I classify this? And there's no right answer. So you know, I bet even the science team will disagree on some of these. So what do you guys see? Well, I guess the first thing to say is we classify the central object. Very good. Yes, very true. So we ignore the, uh, the other ones to start with anyway. Um, I see features, although I don't, don't know that I could say exactly what it is, but like there's a brighter bit in the middle, and then it's fainter on the edges. Yeah, to me, it looks like, it's hard to see, but it looks like there's kind of a, like a bulge in the middle that's a little bit more elongated than the more spherical, more circular part of the main galaxy. So to me, that's a feature. So I might say features as well. I would click feature too, but then I would probably say no to pretty much everything. <laughs> Not edge on, I don't see a bar, I don't see spirals. Right. I guess you'd say there's a bulge there. Oh, you don't think that, you don't think you could argue there's a bar? Since I it's see a bar. differently than the disc. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a disc. Yeah. Okay. And then, of course, is this a merger? Is this an overlap? Mm. See, we ask about mergers, but we don't actually ask about overlaps. We rely on people to come in to talk and say, these two galaxies look like they're merging, but actually they just happen to be on top of one another because it's a two-dimensional image. So, Bill, you're an overlap expert. What do you think? I, I think that looks interacting because the reddish bulge in that other galaxy over to the right is off-center. Right. So I think they know something about each other. And it looks a bit disturbed, that other galaxy, too, right? It's, like, elongated. It could be tidal tails. Could be. To the upper right. Might not be. Now, I actually want to share something with you guys that I have discovered and I realize that most people probably don't do. It's not such an issue in this image. But um, some of the images, because when we, when we decide what kind of colors and brightnesses to show, um, we vary the brightness of the image, so the scale of the image. Um, we vary it 
based on how bright the image is, how bright the source is. And so you, you have this auto scaling thing, and it does pretty well. Like in this image, you can see a little bit of the noise, and you can see the details, and that's very good. But occasionally, it's a little bit low for me. Um, so let me see if I can find one. This is an interesting one. So, so this one is an example that I think is a little bit low. And you guys can see my mouse, right? Yeah. So I want to try something. I have a Mac, and in the Mac, I can take screenshots. And when I try to take a screenshot and draw it, see if this shows up. Can you guys see this? I can't tell. Well, if you, if you take a screenshot and you draw a box over the source, it actually like highlights the pixels that you're taking the screenshot of. And that has the effect of making it look brighter. So it doesn't help you during the classification, really, but you can look for like extra little title features afterward, which I've always thought was useful for me. How about this one? This one is, I would describe what, a sort of edge on-ish maybe? Is it smooth? Is it featured? There's this little blue kind of smudgy thing that's above, it's, it's sort of at the noon position on this galaxy. I would probably click uh, smooth for that one and, and you know the elongated smooth one just because mm. I really don't think you can see any details in that image. I have a question about this one. Is this a Vorbar? Oh. Mm. <laughs> well, because this little blue smudge, I mean, in the Sloan images, blue is the color of the Vorverbs, um, which are the, the ionized gas clouds that are the, the signatures of gas that's been heated by a black hole. Um, in this case, though, it's Hubble, so the colors mean something different, and a Vorverb could be blue. It could technically be green or red, depending on the redshift. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Actually, again, Bill, you're a Vorver expert. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the the subtlety with trying to pick these clouds out on the Hubble data. Is the color they show up in the image depends on the redshift and the filter selection for that image. Right. So, as you say, they can show up in any color. Uh, in a sense, green is safer because red and blue can be mimicked by something, some collection of stars that's either intrinsically very red or blue and just running off the filter set. Hmm. There's also the issue that most of the Hubble galaxies are going to be a significant record, <sighs> which means that the sort of classical Borver emission line, the auction 3 5007 line... Um, oh, I don't have the gong! You oh, don't have the gong, damn it! Well, too late. Uh, okay. And Kevin, while you're, before you explain, would you mind explaining what the gong is? Because I sort of forgot to do that. All right, so whenever you hear the gong, it means one of us has said uh, something that's not really obvious. So it's some term of jargon that's not really clear, and it's sort of a reminder uh, that we should explain what we're talking about. So one of, one of the, the, the way in which we found the original Volva and how we, we find other things like it is by understanding what it, what it is the Vorbergs are, which is really highly ionized, illuminated gas. And, and, and this gas um, em, emits light back at certain very specific wavelengths that are caused by electrons moving up and down in particular kinds of atoms. And one of the most common and therefore bright transitions in these kinds of clouds is a transition in, in the oxygen atom and it emits at a wavelength, wavelength of 5,007 angstrom, which is sort of, where would that be in, in human it's vision? It's a That's tenth of a nanometer, an angstrom? Yes. Kind of it's very small. Yes. So it's, it's well, yeah, I nanometers. An angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. So I see that color in at low redshift as a slightly bluish green. Yeah. When I was your age, I thought it was emerald green. Mm. I think, I mean, I think the Sloan false color is supposed to vaguely mimic real right. color if we had eyes that could see stuff that, that was that faint, which it, we don't at all, right? If we right. were sort of one filter redward mm. in, in our eyes compared to the Sloan. Oh, is that right? Right, because <clears throat> right, that's why the Vorbrip appears blue, but to our eyes it appears more greenish. Or it would, if we could see that. Um, now, actually, I have seen some kind of greenish things um, in, in the Hubble data as well. And I actually didn't look up any of those for, for showing here. But 
Um, I've seen a couple of these really compact galaxies that are very, very bright in the green filter. Um, and people have been asking, are those the P's? Like, have I found a high redshift P? And it's kind of a complex question, actually. I, mean, I think it's a very good question. Um, so I thought maybe we could discuss what a green P might look like in the Hubble data. First of all, what's a green P? Kevin? So a green P is a galaxy spotted by you guys on the forum, the so-called P's core, who try to give P's a chance. Uh, and you guys found this class of galaxies that in, in, in the SDSS uh, images looked small, round, and green. So obviously they were called P's. And um, the reason they looked small, round, and green is because they're very compact galaxies with very powerful emission lines. Actually, again, the same oxygen-3 5007 line. Uh, but this line was so strong in these galaxies that the filter that contained that emission line was really, really, really bumped up. And so in the red, uh, uh, blue, green, red composite image, the green, where the emission line was, got bumped up, making them appear green. Is it the same and emission line as the vulva? Because the vulva looks yes. blue, but the peas look green. But the peas were at higher redshift. Higher redshift. Wow. So the peas, peas are about at redshift of 0 0.3, which means that that oxygen line was shifted slightly to a redder filter, in this case, the green one. That was a, I like that demonstration, Kevin. <laughs> Don't you know, this, this is basically good. cosmology. Yeah, that was good. Um, dark energy, yeah. Uh, um, so, so, so the P's, we, we, we looked at them, we studied the spectra, we tried to figure out what they are. And what they are is actually really remarkable. They're unlike any other kind of galaxy in the sort of nearby low redshift aged universe. They are very compact, that's why they look small round, and they are green because they're intensely, intensely star forming. So the rate at which they form stars compared to the mass of the stars in the peas is, is huge. So we call this the specific star formation rate, Gongmi. Well, I think you just gonged yourself, really. Gong and by the way, anybody on Twitter can gong us at any time. I was wondering if we were going to get a, a gong for ionized, strangely. Yeah, but, I hmm. thought about gonging Kevin for that, but that seemed mean. He was, he was full blown. It's pretty easy to explain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a, an, an ionized atom is one where it's been hit by such high energy radiation that an electron gets kicked off. And so there's an ion that has a charge. Anyway, continue, Kevin. Sorry. So I'm, I'm loading up a Hubble image that oh, someone has asked about a P, so... Bill, it's I'm loading something. up a spectrum of a green bean. How cool is that? I love technology. Uh, so, P's are these intensely star-forming galaxies, and they're really, really different from all the other galaxies in the nearby universe in that the, 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 the rate at which they're forming stars compared to their total mass, so the rate at which their mass is actually increasing, is way off the charts. And in that way, they are very unlike anything else in the local universe. Similarly, their metallicity, that is the content of heavy metals in the peas, is very much lower than that, what we would expect for other similar galaxies in, in, the, in the local universe. And we should say that by metals, astronomers mean basically anything heavier than helium, which is essentially everything on the periodic table is a metal okay. to an astronomer. For us, carbon's a metal. Yeah, obviously. Oxygen is totally a metal, clearly. Um, okay. So in, in many ways, the, the P's are a lot more like galaxies in the early universe, when star formation was much more common, much more intense. Uh, production of metals, such as carbon and oxygen, wasn't quite as abundant yet and hasn't quite uh, in, enriched galaxies quite as much. So if you'd found a P galaxy at a redshift of two when the universe was maybe, it's a redshift of two, maybe three or four billion years old, um, would have been completely normal, would have been an average star-forming galaxy. But in the local universe, they're totally weird. They're completely different from all other galaxies. So when people say they're finding galaxies that kind of resemble the P's in the Hubble images, that's interesting. So. This is the Hubble image that someone asked if it was a P. So in a, in a way, the answer, are these P's, is kind of a complicated one, as Brooks said, but it's also an interesting one. So you're finding galaxies that are very compact, 
and they appear green in the image, which may suggest some sort of strong emission line signal or not. Um, and in, in that sense, um, the things that we're looking at could be a bit like the peaks. But of course, being a P-like galaxy at a redshift of 2, it means something completely different than there's a redshift 0. At redshift 2, in the early universe, you're completely normal. At redshift 0, or redshift 0.3, in the low redshift universe, the evolved universe, you're a total one, 1 in 100,000, 1 in a million weirdo. So I, I would hesitate to say, let's call all these faint green round small things in the Hubble survey P's, because I think that distract, detracts from what the P's that we found in Sloan uh, tell us. Well, on the other hand, it, it's probably not entirely incorrect either. So now I'm just doing some calculations uh, on, I, I wish I had an envelope to do them on the back of the envelope. Alas, I'm doing it on a piece of note paper. Anyway, um, the 5007 line at redshift 2 would be at, at 15,000 angstroms-ish, which is uh, roughly speaking in the H-band, which in our Hubble images is red. So if it was a redshift 2 galaxy that was uh, very, very strong in this O3 line, it ought to actually be bright red. Mm -hmm. Right? Did and I do that wrong? There was right. a discussion also in Sloan where people were looking for what they called the red lentils. Mm -hmm. So these were P, like the P's, but the O3 emission line was redshifted into the red filter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they found a few of these so called red, red lentil galaxies. I guess the problem there would be that M dwarfs and these really low mass stars that are kind of large would be hard to. Take out of that, unless you get. That's kind of what Bill was talking about, right? It's it's. There's a lot of things that can be blue and, and red that'll make a filter that way, but green is kind of specific. And and there's another way to have a sort of P-like thing in the Hubble data, which is to have something with the strongest ultraviolet emission. That's yes, this is the emission line speaking, <laughs> uh, which is to have a very strong ultraviolet Lyman alpha line of hydrogen so red shifted that it comes into not one of the candles infrared filters, but one of the optical filters that gets used for some of the other Hubble data. Because at faint levels, we certainly see these groups of, we've called them subgalactic clumps, which are hugely brighter at the wavelength of Lyman Alpha. Than Please tell me we just got gonged for Lyman Alpha. Uh, no, that was a comment that, that someone had found some of these. Okay. Well, okay, now we've got gonged for Lyman no. Alpha. Okay. <laughs> Bill, do you want to explain Lyman Alpha? Okay. Uh, people may be familiar with the, if they've looked at spectra, with the H alpha line of hydrogen, which at low redshift is out in the deep red, or as we say on my campus, crimson. Uh, uh, there are other transitions. So is that just the big bright one in that spectrum? No, this this actually is oxygen three at redshift point three. This is a, this is a green bean which looks sort of like a green pea, but I happen to have it on this machine. So, so that's the observed wavelength along the yes. bottom, not not the wavelength that it's admitted at. Admitted at, right? Right. So there are other transit. There are whole families of transitions that hydrogen atoms can give off as their electrons lose energy. And the very bottom one, from the first excited state to the, uh, the so-called ground state, is known as Lyman alpha. So other things being equal, it's the strongest emission of hydrogen, but it's way down in the ultraviolet. Uh, in the laboratory, it has a wavelength about three times too short for your eye to see or to travel far through the atmosphere. So most of what we study easily with Lyman Alpha is in the very distant universe, where the redshift brings it into uh, the wavelengths that show up optically. And so at redshifts of Z, uh, essentially from two on up, it's a very important part of studying the distant universe. I love those pauses of astronomers doing math in their heads. 
Well done. I had to write mine down. <clears throat> so I have another galaxy we can look at. Uh, it's another Hubble galaxy. Oh, well, let me quickly give a shout out to Massimo, alias Half65. He's tweeted that he's watching. I saw that. Hello. It's not that often that we give individual shout outs to volunteers. Well done. Um, he's, he's been very, very helpful on talk, especially. Um, well, so this co-author of the overlap catalog. Mm. Fair is fair. If you do that much work, there you go. Oh, and now I keep popping up. I'm the spiral galaxy now. On on. <laughs> so this is um. That's what Karen. it is. <laughs> yeah, please. No, I just said you gave it away. Well, but there's a lot more going on here. What do you see? You see a spiral, right? Most people could probably see those arms. Yeah. The little, little guy to the, to the left. Yeah, is this a merger, do you think? I would say so. Well, it would be a little bit, you know, make, making it totally up here. Uh, this is a little bit like our own Milky Way with a Magellanic cloud. Mm. So the galaxy that's in the process of being uh, cannibalized. What do you think? Is the Magellanic cloud this big compared to our Milky Way? I think maybe a little bit smaller, but not much. It has spiral structure if you look at it in uh, neutral hydrogen. You don't see it in the optical so much because the star formation is only in, in one patch, but if you look at a, a neutral hydrogen map of, of the large Magellanic cloud, it looks like a spiral galaxy. So now, something I don't actually see in this image is uh, dust lanes, necessarily. Maybe I see a little one, but it's hard to tell. Yeah, um, like, I don't see a bar. Yeah, I don't see a bar. I, I do see a bulge. Yeah, I see um, spiral arms. I think one, two, three. I think so. It could. Oh, it would be. It would be hard for me to tell, but I'd say at least two, maybe three. So, yeah, some of the spiral arm questions are very, very difficult, really. Um, and so, actually, we had a question about dust, which is sort of why I mentioned it. I'm trying to segue, um, which is. A really kind of basic question, and I think it's a very good question, is how does dust form, and how does dust, well, not deform, but how do you get rid of dust? How do you destroy dust? Well. Go for it. Anyone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ooh. Dust forms in, in stars, right? In stellar atmosphere. Is that right? Yeah, but it, it can, right? And the particulars of how are, are a bit unknown. Bill, what are you showing here? What's this diagram? That's the Magellanic Clouds in H1. Okay. Stream and everything. That's what it does to a, a perfectly good galaxy if a giant one tries to cannibalize it. Right. If you zoom in on that really bright bit towards the upper left, that looks like a spiral galaxy. Other way. <laughs> you might need, like, a different... Contrast because it looks overexposed to me. Yeah, I. But that has a spiral structure. I yeah. actually didn't know that about the Magellanic Cloud. That's cool. Random factoid of the of the hangout. And <laughs> I'm totally making it up, and now Bill's going to prove me wrong. No, I remember. I'm confident of this fact. I have seen it. I love this. We're getting tweets from people about the classification of the spiral galaxy. Are we? Yeah, people agree with us that, that there's no bar. Um, and people, let's see if I can bring them all up. We've oh, got yeah. no bar, three spiral arms. <clears throat> three spiral arms and distorted anti-clockwise. Spiral having lunch. Spiral like having that. lunch. I like it. It's from Mark Ridgewell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, there's something twisted about one of those arms. Mm. Mm. This is Galaxy Zoo Live, you know. It's, it's good. Although, I mean, the unfortunate thing is with this, we can't actually, like, register your classifications. It's, it's a direct line to the science team, but, yeah. So, all right. Uh, okay, so the question about dust, should we come back to that? I know we're all trying to avoid it. Um, it's a little bit of a mystery, I think, how dust is formed, and actually I am no kind of expert in um, stellar atmospheres. I think it's like the, the outer atmospheres of old stars, old, relatively cool stars, they, they make dust. It's a very chemistry kind of thing, right? Mm. And it's, it's not really dust, dust, like you have in your house. I think it's more like soot. Yeah. It's more like smoke particles, but interstellar smoke gives just completely the wrong impression. Yeah. And we, we do see it being formed 
in the atmospheres of giant supergiant stars in the expanding debris of nova and supernova explosions. Mm. That, that's gotten to be a big deal in the early universe, wondering how much dust does a supernova make, and can that hide a lot of the action in very dust galaxies? By dust, we really just mean particles, so not just single atoms or single molecules floating around in space, but something that is a, a collection of many molecules or atoms. So we can get, for example, um, carbon chains, and so actually organic molecules in space, we consider them dust. Polyaromatic um, hydrocarbons. Yes, we have those. We have quite a few of those, polycyclic aromatic PAHs, we call them. Uh, yeah. And uh, I remember studying them in organic chemistry, but I don't yeah. You know, remember all the details about them, but but uh, there yeah. there are some really mm -hmm. interesting molecules in space, and they do very specific things, and you can see their effects in the spectrum because they have very specific effects in the spectrum. Um, when like dust gets heated, it radiates. References to help us with our cosmic dust question on Twitter. Oh, see, that's very helpful. That helpful. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to, by the way, we can, we can put all these together and put them in a blog post at the end. I usually summarize these hangouts at the end, so we can we can definitely do that. Um, now, let's see, uh, oh, the question of how you destroy dust, because we talked about creating dust in planetary nebula, creating dust in, in supernovae, but very, very intense ionizing radiation can also destroy dust, correct? It's a great word, isn't it? Am I going to make this up, but isn't there a word, spallation? Is there? That, I believe, is the yes. word that means, like, exploding particles of dust because ionizing radiation hits them. I always thought that was a great word. You can also just blow it out of the galaxy if you have a particularly powerful burst of star formation or maybe a active supermassive black hole at the center. The, the wind given off by this intense activity can just take all the, the, the dust and gas and, and blow it out of the galaxy. Or we can turn it into new stars, right? I think isn't the, the theory of uh, star formation and, and seeding the initial cloud starting to collapse does require dust Definitely. Um, yeah, and, 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 and you're you're population free. Somebody hit the gong. <laughs> I never have the gong up. Somebody else has to do it. Ooh, now we get to explain population three, population two, population one stars, and it's another case of astronomers naming things in backwards order. And I have a fun story regarding that. I was on an NPR Science Friday and. Uh, with, with another astrophysicist, and, and we had people calling in, and this woman called us in and said that her son told her, so this is a great explanation of population one, population two stars, her son had told her that our son was actually our second son, and there was one before it. And we sort of, on live radio, were going like, what? what? And, and, and so eventually it hit me, it's like, ah, oh, what she actually heard was an explanation of population one and population two stars. So before population three stars, which we'll, we'll get to later and maybe Bill can tell us about, there were two populations of stars. There were stars that were relatively free of metals such as carbon and uh, oxygen and magnesium and, and other things that you would never call metals on Earth, but anyway, uh, we, we do. And then there's a second population of stars in the Milky Way that is much more enriched in, in those uh, heavy metals. And I guess and it does make sense. So our star is population one because it's the most important. It's the most recent, right? And it's the one we found first. Yeah. And so it's all, for all of those chronological type historical <laughs> reasons, it's called population one. But in fact, very much like the magnitude system, that being the first magnitude, being the brightest that was seen, so, so the, 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 the point there is that our sun must have been born after the first generation of normal stars, you know, liberated all those heavy metals either through going supernova or by being an asymptotic giant branch star, which we can, shouldn't get into. Please don't gong me. No, uh, it does are worth like a whole show. So, um, <laughs> but so, so, so there must have been a generation of stars that polluted the gas and dust around it that then collapsed and formed a second generation of stars. And so our sun, because you know, if you look around us, we're, we're made of metals. Um, 
those must have come from a previous generation of stars. And similarly, if you look at our sun, you'll find it's actually quite enriched with carbon and magnesium and all these things. And, and so that hence the first sun, second sun. But those uh, population two stars that haven't created a bunch of dust in planetary nebulae and supernova, they still have metals, right? So where did the first metals come from? Did they come from the Big Bang? It's a loaded question, I yeah. Bill, maybe somebody, Karen? Well, we're very, um, we have really good models of, of what uh, the different elements were made in the Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So the, the different elements made in the Big Bang. And, and we know that there must have been some step making metals between that and the population two stars. And that step got called population three stars. And the usual, the things that happen to make stars today wouldn't work. No. Pure hydrogen, no. helium at the time the population three, you know, the still sort of mythical population would have to be formed. The gas has to dump energy, it has to cool to fall together under gravity. And the most powerful ways to do that today have to do with heavy elements, with metals. Radiation given off by carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and far infrared radiation from dust grains. Population three had none of these. Isn't it true too that that we think you can't make molecules? Right, you get you get two yeah. two atoms onto a dust grain and they they meet yeah. and they, they see the, each um, other across the plane of the molecule and they come together. You know, I tell my classes that dust grains are singles bars for atoms. <laughs> ah, <I like> that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, people have tried uh, with increasing fidelity to simulate what happens to a cloud of gas if it doesn't have any of these processes. Mm. And you can still make stars, but most of the simulations show that the stars are really massive by today's standards, really hot. So they, and they're so hot, put out so much radiation, that they may shut down the growth of any stars around them. So they come one to a proto galaxy. Then when they blow up, it got very exciting. Processes happen that no longer happen. They're hotter than today's stars. So one of these stars could blow up. It could be 100 to 300 times the solar, the, the mass of the sun. And then it could dump, in some simulations, 40 solar masses of carbon and nitrogen into the surrounding gas. Once that happens, it gets mixed with the gas. Then you have population two stars. So people are going looking so far without a great deal of success for the predicted abundances of elements produced by one of these in the oldest, most pristine stars that we can find throughout the Milky Way. So we have another question, and I think we should probably make it the last question before we finish. Uh, let me see, I'm going to look it up because I've now lost off the screen. Um, it's from Alan Eggleston, and it came from Twitter. And the question is, is the gl glowing green planetary nebula IC1295, which I have up, I'll put up on the screen share in a second, 3,300 light years away from Earth, like a P galaxy, because it's green? So let me, let me look that up. Screen share, oh wait, hang on. Uh, so it is, I mean, it is, I, it is bright kind of green, and I expect that it is bright green because it comes from O3. Uh, is anyone here an expert on planetary nebulae? I'm Googling planetary nebula spectrum as a... Oh, good, all right. They do have very strong O3, and that, that gives them, if they're bright enough, uh, you can see that they're green in a telescope eyepiece. They're just big so clumps of ionized gas around a dead star, right? You're right, and a, we should specify here. I think some Galaxy Zoo users will know this. The 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 really yeah. hardcore users certainly will. But um, the the name planetary nebulae, uh, it's kind of an example of astronomers massively failing at naming things again. Uh, I think many astronomy names for for phenomena and classes of objects are pretty good, like I like neutron star and black hole and stuff, but a planetary nebula has nothing to do with a planet. People thought it was, and that's why it was historically named that way. But it's, it's kind of the gas cloud, the, the, the atmosphere that's sloughed off by a, a star that is dying rather gently so as compared to a supernova. will turn into a planetary nebula in about 5 billion years, right? Well, a bit longer than that. I'm now searching through the spectral atlas of planetary nebulae. 
Oh, such a thing exists. We can put the link to it on the blog. That's really interesting. Do you, do you know where that image comes from, Brooke? Do you have the caption or the... Um, <clears throat> uh, let me see, actually. <laughs> I uh, love that your, your browser there is a ex classic example of a scientist browser. Yeah, I have a lot of tabs open. Mm. Yeah, I have a lot of memory on my computer, so... Let's see, redorbit.com. Shall we visit the page and see? I don't know what this is going to be. This is a little bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> You're really Maybe clicking so. on a random link on the internet on a live <laughs> live chat. That really could have gone very badly, but it's all right. It's ESO. Mm -hmm. it looks so, like from it. looking at um, the, the spectral atlas of planetary nebulae, it looks like indeed the O3 5007 line is very, very prominent. Right. Here's here's one here actually done with our campus telescope, and here I'm I'm moving my cursor if you can see it. Is the O3 5007 emission line in a planetary nebula. This is done from your campus telescope. Yes. What size is that? Uh, 0.4 meters. Okay, so that's kind of a big amateur telescope, but that's definitely ac accessible to an amateur that size. Well, you have to be a pretty dedicated amateur, I'd say, <laughs> but you could do it. And, and you have to get a spectrograph. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you have to be pretty dedicated, but you can do it. I, I was recently at this weekend it was um, the, it British. Was the, the yeah. British Astronomical Association, which is they the... They cool kit, don't they? Yeah, they do. I it was really neat. They... Go, and I was expecting to go out observing after my talk, and but no, you know, they have like their observatories set up in their houses. And... No, they, they invited me to give a talk about Zooniverse and Galaxy Zoo, so I told the story of the Vorverps, and I talked about Bulge's galaxies, because mm -hmm. speaker's prerogative. And um, it was really great. They were really asked really good questions and you know they all knew all about spectra and, and O3 and H alpha and all of that they love the HST images of the Vorverpias and um, anyway it, it happened to be clear which I have to say since I've moved to England the weather has not been great <laughs> um, they haven't had very many clear nights for observing like Comet Fan Stars is still up in the sky but I haven't been able to see it because we've been we've had clouds every time and it's fairly low on the horizon in March yeah never mind yeah. Um, so, anyway, but it was it was finally clear. So we got to go out and lots of different telescopes, lots of great pairs of binoculars and things. And at the time, I don't know if this is still true, but the comet and M thirty one, the Andromeda Galaxy, were sort of right on top of one another on the sky. Well, not on top, but very close. And in fact, the uh, the comet's tail actually kind of blended in to Andromeda, and it, it made me think that it would be really interesting to see that as like kind of an overlap, a cometary overlap with M31. Um, but I got to see that and a, a couple of other really cool things. That was really neat. Met some great, great people. So that was exciting. And they all really like Galaxy Zoo too. So, um, all right, do we have any other questions? Because I think we've been, getting, we've been getting some really great tweets actually. People have been tweeting background information as we talk. So I'm going to collect those and put all of this on the blog. And um, I've had already a couple of comments that people like this time, so this is definitely a good time for North Americans. Um, it, it seems like we're getting almost the same turnout, actually, in terms of the science team. Um, I know Kyle wanted to be here, but he couldn't because he's on a plane. He was just talking about Galaxy Zoo at Yale, actually. Um, but we'll try... Dingoes. Sorry? I thought he was being chased by dingoes. Oh, well. Maybe he was ch being chased by raccoons in, in New Haven. Exactly. Now we're totally into making inside jokes about New Haven. This is just not funny to anybody else, but that's okay. <laughs> Scientists are regularly used to not being that funny. I have no idea what you guys are talking exactly. about. Exactly. See? Not even the science team knows about this joke, and it would take way too long to explain. So... Um, we will sign off for now, but we have these hangouts every couple of weeks or so, and uh, we'll be announcing the next one on the blog, on Twitter. I've made a, a thread on talk, so keep an eye out for that. It'll be on the featured side. Um, and I should say, we are expecting talk to be upgraded at some point. I'm not exactly sure when yet, but I will make an announcement when I know more, when we know more. So um, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, does anyone else have anything specific? No. Silent faces. Oh, nice! <laughs> Those are little green oxygen three men that Bill has just put on his head. Right. Special. <laughs> o plus, N plus. 
Oh. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Thanks for joining us, everyone. And uh, we're signing off, and we'll see you next time. Bye.